All right, so now let's uh, uh, reap the benefit of uh, all of this work and, and get a, a log n algorithm for the weighted star. So this, this is not uh, our contribution. This was known for some time. Uh, there was a very nice paper by Bourbinder, Bensal, and uh, Nao uh, that got this in 2008. Uh, but the algorithm was kind of, you know, they just presented the continuous time algorithm without any motivation. I, I don't really know how they came up with it. But uh, basically what we do is that we're going to derive the same algorithm, except that it's completely justified by the mirror descent framework, and then it allows us to go further. But let's do the weighted star case. So the first thing that I need to tell you is what is this norm that we have been talking about, right? So, so again, the weighted star is like this. Our metric space are just the leaves of this, uh, of this tree. And we have weights on the edges, w1 up to wn. So let's say you, you make an infinitesimal movement. OK, so let's say that what you want to do is that you want to remove 0.1 mass here, and you want to add 0.1 mass there. OK, you have some distribution, and you want to change it to a new distribution, which has minus 0.1 mass here and plus 0.1 mass there. So what do you do? You need to take the mass, this uh, 0.1 mass here, and you need to remove it. So what you're going to do is that you can think conceptually this mass is going to transfer that edge. It's going to go through that edge, and you're going to store it at the root. So now you have 0.1 mass at the root, and you have to add 0.1 mass there. So you're just going to traverse now this edge. OK, so what I'm saying, all I'm saying is that the norm that you're looking at is simply a weighted L1 norm. It's the sum for i equals 1 to n of wi absolute value of hi. Okay? If I want to have a delta of hi at location i, I will either need, if, you know, if it's negative, I need absolute I need minus hi to go out of this edge. So I, I pay wi times minus hi. And if hi is positive, I need hi to enter this node. So I need to pay wi times hi. Okay? So I just have a weighted L1 norm. That's the norm I'm going to work with. OK, so now design of the mirror map. So, uh, yeah. so in particular, the dual norm, right? The dual norm is just a weighted n infinity. It's just the max for i equal in 1 to n of 1 over wi uh, hi. Right? That's, uh, that's the dual norm of this L1 norm. OK, so design of the mirror map. So it's, it's fairly reasonable. So what do we want of the mirror map? Okay, We want uh, two things. One of them is we want to control its Lipschitz constant in the corresponding dual norm, which is this weighted L infinity norm. And we want to be able to control the movement cost. Okay, What is the movement cost? The movement cost. The movement cost of alg, it's nothing but uh, it's a norm of the time derivative of x. And since this is mirror descent, it's the norm of the inverse Hessian of phi at xt inverse applied to xt plus lambda t. OK? So we see. Already, there is two parts to the movement cost. There is one part, sorry, this is a CT, not XT. So, eta CT. So, there is one part to the movement cost which is due to the cost function. And there is one part of the movement which is due to the constraints. OK, so we will deal differently with those two parts. But let me focus for the moment on the movement which is induced by the cost function. OK, so we want to be able to control this thing. And you see that they, they are kind of opposite. If I want this to be small, I need phi to be to be kind of uh, I need phi to be big, right? If phi is big, then this is small. But if phi is big, then the Lipschitz constant is big. So you can see that there is a trade-off there. There is a, an optimization. Okay, so design of the mirror map. So it's natural to first look for a separable map. To first look at separable maps. What do I mean by that? I just mean that phi of x decomposes in the form the sum for i equals 1 to n of phi i of xi. 
right? Uh, one variable calculus is nice. Multiple uh, variable calculus is uh, more complicated. So let's try to resort to only differentiated uh, one variable functions. Let's see what happens in this case. OK, so the Hessian, OK, so the gradient of phi, maybe let's do first the movement calculation. The Hessian of phi of x inverse, this is nothing but the function, uh, which is the matrix, which is a diagonal matrix. And on its diagonal, it has 1 over the double derivative of xi. Double derivative of phi i evaluated at xi. Right, this is my inverse map. OK, so the, the movement, the movement due to the cost function, to CT, what is this? OK, so it's the inverse Hessian times eta times CT. OK, and it's the L1, the weighted L1 norm of this. So it's just the sum for i equals 1 to n of ci of t divided by phi i double prime of xi of t. And I forget the wi, which is here. Right? Phi, phi, phi i is convex, so phi i double prime is uh, non-negative. So this is the movement cost. Uh, this is the movement cost due to the cost function. OK, so I didn't take into account the lambda t yet. I just took into account the ct. Is that clear, this term, where it comes from? So again, it's just, uh, if you want, this is the norm of the Hessian inverse of phi at xt applied to uh, ct. OK, it's this thing. Good. And let's say there is an eta, just to be clear. OK. Now, as I said before the break, the whole magic of analysis of online algorithms is into reasoning about opt. And the whole magic of mirror descent is that you don't need to think about opt anymore. You can simply use the service cost of the algorithm as a proxy for opt. What is the service cost of the algorithm? It's just the sum of the CIT, XIT. So now let's just design phi i double prime so that this is equal to xit cit. Uh, what do I want to erase? Yeah, this is fine. OK, so we want. that the sum of the CIT WI over uh, phi i double prime of x i, maybe let's remove the t. We want this to be bounded by the sum over i of CI xi. Right? This is the service cost. And this is the movement cost due to c. So if we had this inequality and uh, there was no Lagrangian part, which is, is actually going to be OK, then we would get that you know, because of the learning rate, we, then the movement cost would be actually smaller than eta times the service cost, which is smaller than eta times opt, okay? which implies that you're eta competitive. And remember that eta is a learning rate. I took it to be the Lipschitz constant. So if I have this inequality, then it's all about just controlling, the, just seeing what is the Lipschitz constant of this function. OK, so now I can, I can design my phi i. So let's just take it to be equal, or even equal. So let's take it to be equal. So what do we want? We want phi i. So if I want it to be equal, phi i double prime of s, let's say, this should be uh, wi over s, okay? which is implied by phi i of s is wi s log s. Right? If I differentiate twice s log s, I guess uh, I get uh, 1 over s. 
okay, which, which is the same thing as saying that phi of x is this kind of weighted entropy, the sum for i equals 1 to n of wi xi log xi. So you see it's mixing information and metric information. I mean, it's mixing like whatever, bits of information and, and these distances, this metric type distance. So if you, if, you do mir if you run mirror descent with this phi, what I'm saying is that the movement cost up to the Lagrangian part, which is not a problem here, is in fact equal to the service cost, which is itself always bounded by opt. And this is up to le the learning rate eta. So now with this phi, we only have to compute the Lipschitz constant. Is that, is that clear? Yeah? Do you see what's the, what the problem now? Yes, the, Lip <laughs> <laughs> the Lipschitz constant is infinite, OK? Uh, the gradient of this is uh, log x. And log x at 0, it's, uh, OK, it's minus infinity, OK? So in absolute value, it's plus infinity. So this is not Lipschitz. And there is a very good reason it was not at all, uh, it's not at all a surprise when you get there if you know about online learning. Uh, it's because multiplicative weights only as a regret guarantee, it does not have what's called a shifting regret guarantee. It, it cannot track an optimum, okay? So this third miracle, uh, which is here, I call it the tracking miracle, and it's, it's in a sense well known, it wasn't expressed like that, but it's in a sense well known that you shouldn't use the entropy per se, but you should use something like a shifted entropy, or you should make sure that things do not get close to zero. So uh, Manfred Warmus called this with Olivier Bousquet, um, um, mixing with the past. So he always, what they were doing is that they were doing exponential weights, but at every time step, they were mixing a little bit of the uniform distribution with it to make sure that you never get close to zero. And they showed that you can get uh, shifting regret bounds like this. But in fact, for me, a simpler way to view it, uh, because I prefer calculus, is to just change this map and, and to, instead of having x, x log x, to just have x plus delta log x plus delta. So let's see what happens. Okay, so problem, the norm, the dual norm of the gradient can be infinity. Okay, the fix is, uh, so it goes back, in fact, to, uh, goes back to Herbster uh, and Wamos and also in a very nice paper of Bousquet and Warmos. But this was the first one, 2000-ish. Uh, so the fix is to consider the following function, uh, phi of x, which is the sum of wi xi plus delta log xi plus delta. So now, the Lipschitz constant of this, the dual norm of the gradient of phi of x, you see you're going to have uh, this log x plus delta with a wi. So the, L in, the weighted L infinity norm is going to be the maximum of log x plus delta, which is uh, log 1 over delta. So this is bounded by log 1 over delta. Okay. So what we will be, we will be log 1 over delta competitive. Okay, but of course I need uh, what, is the, uh, what is the limitation on delta? Okay, you, you must be paying somewhere else, otherwise I can just take a huge delta and then, you know, you're, you're, you're just uh, you're one competitive or something. So what is limiting you? is that now this is changing this calculation of the movement. How is it changing it? Well, now with this phi, the second derivative is, uh, let me see, it's s plus delta, right? Wi over s plus delta. So here I get ci xi plus delta. OK, so now we get extra movement. 
of delta c times the vector 1. Okay, so that's the extra movement which is induced uh, by, by this thing, okay, by adding plus delta. So now there are many reasons uh, to expect that if you take delta of order 1 over n, this is going to be fine. And we're going to prove it, but and, uh, it would take a long time to explain the many reasons why you can expect it, but to actually prove it, it's very simple. But let me just say it anyway. So many reasons to expect that delta of order 1 over n will, will be fine. Meaning, what I mean by that is that delta c times 1, if delta is of order 1 over n, should be bounded by c times x, let's say, when you integrate. OK, so this term, it's also of order of the service cost. It's not too different. So this would mean that the movement cost, you know, it had this part, which was literally the service cost, and the second new part, which comes from this regularization, um, and this second part is also of order of the movement cost. Okay, so, and this will be true only when delta is of order 1 over n, which in turn will give you the log n competitive. And just to, to give you some keywords, if you want to look more at this literature, so in the 80s and 90s, in fact, going back uh, further, uh, when you push the combinatorial method that I told you about further, what you get into is what's called the work function algorithm. And see, if you apply work function type reasoning, you will see that uh, this is exactly like a work function. So basically, the cost should be roughly the same on every location, which is exactly saying that 1 over n times, uh, one, over n times the 1 vector should be the same as any other probability vector like x. Okay. Uh, but anyway, we're just going to prove it. <laughs> and what's nice is you can, again, prove it by looking at a, a Bregman divergence potential which is, uh, I don't know, weird. Uh, OK, so to clarify, there is two things left to do to complete the proof. Uh, one thing left to do is to prove this statement, that delta c times 1 is of the order of c times x, when delta is like 1 over n. And the other thing is to explain to you uh, the Lagrangian movement, that the Lagrangian movement is not an issue either. These are two, the two things that we need to do. And then we will move on to a more complicated matrix space, which is a, 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 a complete tree. And we'll do the more general matrix spaces tomorrow. OK. So we have basically two lemma. OK, I guess uh, you, know, you, you want to prove something like this. But we, we already proved inequalities of, of this form. I actually just erased them when we said that the service cost of the algorithm was bounded by the service cost of, of opt. Now we're saying the service cost of this kind of constant algorithm should be bounded by the service cost of our actual algorithm. So just like before, we were looking at the Bregman divergence to prove this, we're again going to look at the Bregman divergence. So let's call this uh, star. So let's do the proof of star. And as we do the proof, we'll also get to a formal statement. So proof of star. So consider the following potential. The Bregman divergence between delta and x. OK? And So let's differentiate this thing. So d over dt of the Bregman divergence between delta, so delta times, OK. I'm, I'm going to generalize the discussion a, a little bit. It will be easier, OK? So assume that k 
is of the following form. It's non-negative entries and linear constraint. Right now, so far, we only considered the simplex. So the linear constraints are just that the sum of the xi is 1, and that's the only constraint. But very soon, we're going to move to a more complicated metric space, which will be a tree, and we'll have more complicated constraints. So let me straight uh, go for the generalization of, of this. And assume that delta, the regularization parameter that we're going to look at, is in this set k. And that it actually satisfies those inequalities with equalities. A delta is equal to b. So in the case of the simplex, this is exactly saying that the sum of the delta i should be 1. The sum of the entries of this vector delta should be 1, which will be the case for delta times all 1 if delta is 1 over n. Okay, so this is just saying in the case of the, of the simplex that delta should itself be a probability vector. OK, so now let's do the time derivative of this thing. d phi delta times x of, uh, compared to x of t. So what do I get? Well, it's the same story. You know, you, you get a gradient which cancels, and you only get the Hessian term. So you get minus the Hessian phi at x t applied to x dot of t uh, in a product with so what is it? It's delta minus x of t. OK, so this is an equality. We did it already several times. You just have several terms. The gradient terms, they cancel. And there is only the second order terms that's left. And again, uh, mirror descent is defined so that you know what is the value of this. So minus this, this is exactly equal to eta um, c of t plus lambda of t inner product with delta minus x of t. OK, so we see one term that we like in this, which is c of t times delta minus x of t. Uh, right, and this is with an equality. But the point is now it's very important what is the side of the inequality that we want. Before, we used to say lambda t is in the normal cone. So lambda t inner product with delta minus xt, we said that this is uh, non-negative. But if we do that, so if we say this, we're not in good shape because um, what we want is to actually say that ct dot delta is smaller than ct dot xt. And if we have this non-negativity, we're going to say that ct dot delta is smaller than ct dot xt. OK, so this is not going the right way. But this is now where we're going to use the fact that delta satisfies the linear uh, uh, constraints with equality. So because delta satisfies the linear constraint with equality, this is actually equal to eta ct inner product with delta minus xt. Because uh, of this. OK, so because delta satisfies the linear uh, constraints with equalities, when you time it uh, the Lagrange multiplier, you actually get uh, 0 Okay, for this thing. Actually, oh, you get this. OK, good. Um, I mean, and you get equality because you also have the other side. OK, so I mean, this is a little argument. You just need to express what is this Lagrange multiplier. I don't want to do it now, but uh, it's, like, it's true. It's an, it's an equality. So what you see is ct dot delta is, in fact, equal to ct dot x up to a term which integrates to a constant. So what you get is literally here that this is true plus a constant. Okay, so the movement due to the cost function on, uh, uh, with the delta is also bounded by the service cost. Okay, so now if you're
following very closely, you should be extremely suspicious because it could be that the cost, I said it several times, that the cost could be infinite at some location. So ct dot delta could actually be infinite. So in general, this is grossly false. But there is a subtlety, which is that I satisfy this part with equality, but not, of course, not this part. There are two parts here. Okay, the Lagrange multiplier lambda, it takes both the non-negativity constraint and this linear constraint ax less than b, and delta is certainly not equal to zero. Okay, so there is a part here which is non-trivial. So this, <laughs> this is true assuming that the constraint uh, x of t non-negative is inactive. And there are many ways to fix this, but at a high level, the intuition is simply that you can think about, you have this cost function, and at some point I have a zero probability to be in some state, then whenever I get a cost at this thing, I can just ignore it. I'm already not there. So you know, if the adversary puts a cost at this location, he's only making the life of opt harder. My life is the same, I'm not there, okay? So one way to do this is through what's called reduced cost. So I just don't, these are technicalities really not interesting, but, but you know, if you don't take them into account, it's just grossly false. Uh, so these reduced costs are, are, are just of the following form. If xit equals zero, then let's say c hat it is equal to zero, and otherwise, c hat it is equal to c it. Okay, so what I'm saying is that for any location where I have some probability of being there, I just record the regular cost. But if I had a zero probability to be there, I don't record the cost. I act as if there was no cost there. Okay, it's only making uh, uh, the life of opt easier, and it's not changing anything for me. So if I can prove competitive ratio with respect to the c hat, I also have competitive ratio with respect to the C. Again, mild technicalities, but they are important because otherwise you cannot prove such statements. Really what those reduced costs are, just to again clarify, really what those reduced costs are, they are really the original cost minus the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to the non-negativity constraint. That's really what they are. Okay, good, but long story short, if you are in this very general setting where you're, we're gonna move in some convex body defined by those linear constraints, and my regularization term satisfies the linear constraint with equality, except for the non-negativity ones, then I get that delta dot ct is always bounded by x dot c. Okay, so now, now I need to talk about Lagrange multipliers. But are we good with, except for the part of the Lagrange multiplier in the movement cost, are we okay? There are many things going on at the same time. I realize this as I speak. Uh, are we okay with the, with the big picture proof? So again, maybe I say, I, I, it's, it's hard, you know, I feel like I'm repeating myself 10 times, but uh, Maybe not. So let me say it one last time, what's the general scheme? General scheme is the service cost is just always bounded by opt. Now I want the movement cost to be bounded by, say, my learning rate times the service cost, which in turn then will be bounded by eta times opt. When I choose my mirror map to be the shifted entropy, this is the sum of wxi uh, plus delta log xi plus delta, I find that my movement cost, which is the inverse Hessian applied to the cost plus the Lagrange multiplier. So if I ignore the Lagrange multiplier, the inverse Hessian applied to the cost is exactly my service cost plus a new term, this delta dot C. And what this lemma proves is that if delta, this regularization term, in general, I pick it like this, then delta dot C 
uh, delta dot c is in fact always equal to delta dot x plus a little bit. And this little bit integrates overall to a constant because this little bit is a time derivative of something. So eventually, I get uh, that my movement cost is bounded by basically twice 2 eta times the service cost. And we found that eta is exactly log 1 over delta. So I get log n competitive. That's how you wrap everything up. It yes. shows also that we don't need the 1 over n multiplied by 1, but only something that. Uh, yes, yes, you can have other. Yes, absolutely. Yes, totally. You can have other regularization. Uh, but, but what's going to happen? So if you have a general delta i, what is going to be here? You're going to have the max over i of the log 1 over delta i. This is going to be your Lipschitz constant. So the best you can do is actually to make them all equal. I agree. The only constraint is that the sum of the delta i should be 1 for this part to be true. And then in turn, the Lipschitz constant is the max over i of log 1 over delta i. So, but if you want, you, you could have a regularization of 1 half on location 1 and 1 over 2n on all the other locations. This will hurt you by a little bit. And in fact, in some cases, it could make sense to do that. If you have some prior information that opt is going to be more likely to be in the first state, then maybe you want to regularize differently. So these things can make sense. Absolutely. <laughs> So this is really this is not a, a, a deep part of the argument, this plus delta. And, and what you're just saying, in fact, foreshadows uh, some of the more recent developments that in the more general case, we'll see that you can have a delta. Delta could also be a function of x. As you go, you might want to adapt the regularization and so on and so forth. So yeah. OK, let's do a little bit of uh, duality. I mean, just Lagrange multipliers. OK. So what about lambda t? So what, I, what, what is lambda t? OK, so what is k? k, again, is x is, let's say, in Rn. And we have x, which is non-negative. And the sum of the xi is equal to 1. So the normal cone, you remember the very first calculation we did in the first hour uh, of this course, was the normal cone of things like that. So in the normal cone, there will be two terms. There will be a Lagrange multiplier. Let's call it xi uh, non-negative for this part. And there will be some Lagrange multiplier mu, which could be positive or negative, because it's an, ident it's an equality for this condition. OK, so the normal cone, nk, at x, it's of, of the form, uh, uh, let me think, so minus xi minus mu, minus, yeah, minus xi minus mu times the all one vector, where mu is just a real number, and xi is non negative, and xi i. Uh, strictly positive is equivalent to xi equals 0. I mean, or rather, uh, if and only if xi is equal to 0. Or actually, only if. Sorry. OK, so the, the, these uh, Lagrange multiplier corresponding to the non-negativity constraints, they are 0 if xi is strictly positive, if it's not acting. And they are non-zero. They can only be non-zero if xi is 0. OK, but let's see very concretely what those Lagrange multipliers mean. They really mean some movement. You know, they really imply something for the dynamics. Very, very concrete.
OK, so the very concrete thing is like this. Um, x dot at location i, what is this? So this is uh, minus 1 over phi i double prime of xi of t applied to eta cit plus lambda i of t. OK, so what is this? This is minus um, xi plus delta over wi applied to eta ci. And then what do I have? I have minus xi i minus mu. OK, so the, this is the algorithm. This is the algorithm. And let's see what, what those things do on the dynamics exactly. So we have this tree. And we have some with the weight. And we have some cost function that arrives. OK, maybe it's something like this. This is some cost function that arrives. So there are several parts. This CI, what it's saying is that I should decrease the mass at the location which have some cost. And what I do is that if I have a cost and I have a lot of mass there, then I decrease more rapidly. This is multiplicative weights. If I already have very little mass, then it's going to take me bigger cost to decrease more the mass there. Okay, this is a multiplicative weights part. And this makes a lot of sense because it's saying that my movement is related to my service cost, which is exactly what we want. Then there is some other part, which is the Lagrangian part. So let's see this part, so minus xi i. So you have a minus and a minus. So this part is a, is a push up. This is saying uh, don't decrease too much. And why, why do you have a push up? It's because the things are floored. You see, x should not go below 0. If you just add this part and ci was very, very big, then you might go below 0. So what this part is doing is that it's preventing you from going to 0. Okay, and this is what I was trying to tell you before, is that this is exactly the reduced cost. This is your c hat of i. This is exactly the effective cost. If I stop putting a cost when the, the mass reaches 0, then in fact there is no xi i. Xi i is never appears. Okay, so this is my reduced cost. Now there is one last term, which is this minus minus mu. And what could this last term do? Well, this last term, Remember, I should keep that I have a probability distribution. So this last term is making things increase so that I keep that the sum of the xi is 1. Imagine I just had a, a cost at one location. Say I just have a cost here. OK, I have a big cost there. Then I want to decrease the mass. But this mass needs to be redistributed in other location. So what mu is doing is that it's exactly doing this redistribution of mass. And this redistribution of mass is also done in a multiplicative way. OK, so locations which have more mass tend to attract also more mass. OK, uh, so in particular, we see, we see that necessarily uh, mu must be non-negative. It has to be. Because otherwise, everything is pushing down. And the sum of the derivative should be 0. So it must be that mu is non-negative. So you see, there is only one thing pushing down. These two things are pushing up, and this is pushing down. But for the movement cost, I can only think, I can, if I want, only things, look at things that are going down. I don't need to look at both things that, that are going up and down. Okay. For the movement cost, for the movement cost up to a factor 2, it is enough to look, say, at the norm of the negative part of xt dot. But everything which is going in, eventually it goes out unless it stays there forever, and then you know it's just a constant. So I can only look at the negative part, which means I can 
for the, for the star, if I want, I can entirely ignore the Lagrange multiplier and only look at the movement cost induced by the cost function. Okay, so everything we did, in fact, is already justified. You don't need to look at the movement induced by the Lagrange multiplier. The movement induced by the Lagrange multiplier is only things going up. It does not induce anything going down. Okay, so this completes the proof of the log n for the weighted star. Is there any question before I move on to something more complicated? <laughs> No? It's that clear? Um, okay. All right. Okay, so let's do the tree case. And maybe I won't do the full calculation in the tree case. Uh, I will just tell you what's, what's different. Okay, so beyond stars, trees. Okay, so now my metric space are the leaves of a general tree. Okay, so I have a tree like this. Okay, and this is my metric space. This is x. And at any vertex uh, u, I have some edge weight wu on the parent. OK, so this is much, much more general than the stars. Yes? What about lambda is that? What, say again? Lambda is that. The dimension for the star is lambda So the lambda i? Oh, the lambda dot. Uh, there is no lambda dot. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the lambda dot appears in the second derivative of xi. Like, the first derivative of x only appear, makes appear lambda. Yeah. So we don't need to look at the second derivative of x. We will do a second derivative tomorrow, but uh, yeah. I will explain. Second derivative is, uh, is a fourth miracle, as you can, yeah, it kind of makes sense, <laughs> I think. Uh, <clears throat> okay. All right, so uh, what, what is nice about trees? Uh, what's nice is that the Wasserstein distance is uh, very simple, very clear what's happening. So what's the Wasserstein distance, <sighs> you know, Let's say, again, I want to remove 0.1 mass here and say I want to send, to send it here. Okay, I want to remove a little bit of mass here and I want to add it here. I mean, there is only, and I don't know, this guy it comes from, uh, okay, in this case it's kind of silly, but uh, it comes from here. Okay, it's some pass like that. There is only one way to do it. I have to send this bit of mass all the way up and then all the way down. Okay, that's the only pass. What if I wanted to send it instead uh, here? You know, maybe I want to send 0 0.05 here and 0 0.05 there. Then what am I going to do? Well, what's happening is that if I look at, let's say, it, it, it's like this. Then what's happening is that in that subtree, I have a delta, delta for that subtree. Of minus. 0 0.05. So I know that in that subtree, there must be 0 0.05 mass that leaves the subtree. So I certainly have 0 0.05 mass that goes through wu, that goes through the edge. Okay? So all I'm saying is that in general, if you have x, which is in r to the l, so these are the leaves, then I can define x hat, which is in r to the v, 
by x hat of u at location u. It's the sum over all the leaf in u, okay, in the subtree of u, of xl. Maybe let me not call it x. Let's call it h, some some delta vector. You have some h here, and the uh, Wasser's time, the, the norm, like the w1, if I want to move from x to x plus h, this is exactly the sum over all u of w u h hat u. Okay, in each subtree, I look at the delta of the mass in that subtree. How much mass is either leaving the subtree or entering the subtree. And whatever is that amount of mass, it has to go through the edge just above the subtree. And that's like both a, a, a necessity and it's a plan. So this is an, an identity. This gives you the exact form, formula for the vast distance in the tree. Okay, so that's, that's what's nice about trees, this formula, at least to me. U is a vertex, yes. Yes, by h of u for any u in v. Thank you. So for instance, at the root, you know, uh, if h is a, is, is a displacement vector, then the, the h at the root should be 0, right? The total uh, transfer of mass should be 0 at the root. OK, so you see, it's very similar to what was happening on the star, except that we need to talk about these extra variables. So that's why I wanted to work since the beginning with a general convex body. Is here the simplex is just going to be on the leaf, but we're going to add inner variables to explain how things are moving inside the tree. And that's going to make all the calculation much easier. I'm not saying it's the only way to do it, but that's, that makes things easier to calculate. So let me clarify. Okay, so now we work with k, which is of the following form. k is going to be all the x in r to the v, such that x is non-negative, and x at a vertex u is equal to the sum over all the vertices v whose parent is u of x of v, and I'm very sorry if my u and v look the same. Um, OK, so this is the convex body we're going to work with. And I guess I want also x at the root is 1. OK, so at the root, we have a mass of 1. And we're just going to you know, disperse this mass as we go down. It's just a, if you want, it's a multiscale description of the probability distribution at the leaf. You can really think about this tree as a filtration. You, know, you can say, OK, I have, I have at, the, at the smaller scale, here is the description of my distribution. And as I go up, I look at things you know, more and more fuzzy. Now I just say, you know, if I look at this level of the tree, all I'm describing is what the probability is that I'm in that subtree, what the probability is that I'm in that subtree, and so on and so forth. And because I have a weighted L1 norm on the description of the, of the distribution at every level of the tree, it's natural to run mirror descent with an entropy which is going to be a multi-scale entropy, which is going to give the, the sum of the entropies uh, at every level of the tree. Okay, so we work with k equal to this and phi of x, which is the sum over u of w u, x u plus delta u, log x u plus delta u. And now it's, it's very important to have delta u because you know delta is going to depend on the vertex. We want delta, the vector delta, to be in k.
So that's the algorithm. And this one is, uh, so here is a theorem. This algorithm, so this is a fully described algorithm now, provided that the delta is in this. This algorithm is depth of, uh, of G, of the, of the tree, times log n competitive. OK, so if you have a tree of size uh, 10, this is 10 log n competitive. Okay, if you have a, a, a tree of depth d, this is d log n competitive. OK, so I'm not, I'm not going to do, I mean, maybe I will do this calculation at the end of the course if, if we have time. It's not very difficult, but where these depths come from, uh, this added complexity is now from the Lagrangian analysis. So you can do exactly the same calculation as we did in the, in the star case. Everything works exactly the same except the Lagrangian part. The Lagrangian part is actually non-trivial. Uh, and when you do the Lagrangian analysis, you will get this extra depth term. So let me just tell you, if you want to do it as an exercise, I think you have everything. So uh, some tricks, so some tricks in red. Um, Instead of x non-negative everywhere, you can only take x non-negative for the leaves. Mirror descent will take care of making everything else non-negative, as long as it's non-negative on the leaf. Here, same thing. Instead of equal, enough to take, uh, let me think, we want the mass to increase down the tree. So enough to take this inequality. What is the point of this? two tricks, every linear inequality that you put, you will get a Lagrange multiplier term corresponding to this, which will induce some extra movement, which you will have to deal with. So the less inequalities you write, the easier of a time you will have in the analysis. Okay? So you want to write as few inequalities as possible, and hopefully the dynamics will enforce the rest. Okay? So you can show that. In fact, the dynamic on this polytope with equality and non-negativity uh, uh, non everywhere is equivalent to non-negativity only on the leaf, and here, instead of an equality, only smaller or equal. Think about it. If it's like this, all I'm saying is that the mass, when you go down, should increase. But intuitively, you never have an incentive to have more mass. I mean, if you could get away with disappearing from the state space, you would do it, then you pay cost zero all the time. Okay? So, so all I'm saying here is that you cannot disappear. You have to be somewhere. But then you certainly don't want to be twice there. Make sense? Uh, OK, what time is it? Um, yeah. So again, now it's, it's morally an exercise uh, to prove this theorem. But it doesn't prove the very first theorem that I told you at the beginning. I told you that we can get log squared n um, uh, we can get log squared n for any metric space. So what I will tell you about tomorrow morning is absolutely stunning uh, development, not by us, on this uh, metric Ramsey. So this will be tomorrow. So tomorrow, so in the morning, we'll do the metric Ramsey. Uh, and the metric Ramsey will allow to reduce any metric space to a tree. And uh, it will be, it's like, uh, Really stunning. I mean, now you know people have been working on this for uh, three three decades, I guess, and now we have uh, proofs which are basically one page long of you know a collection of at least a dozen uh, deep and difficult mathematical papers. So all of this is, this should be one hour tomorrow morning, and uh, uh, so that will be that will be the end of MTS. Then we will do uh, the discrete time analysis. So this will be slightly technical, uh, but uh, it should be fine. Uh, and then we will move on to bandits and information geometry. So this will be the, the sec what we're going to look at is the second order derivative of the Bregman divergence. OK, and this is where the information geometry will come in. Uh, OK, so that's the plan for tomorrow. All right, I will stop here. Thanks.